Hello, Steve. Hello, Josh. Hello, yeah, Steve. How are you, Evandro? Very good. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, for giving us the chance of hearing from two of the world's largest financial institutions your views on, on crypto, on this fantastic universe of crypto. As you probably know, this is a very special week for crypto in Brazil, and I guess in a way for the world, right? Because we had the, the beginning of trading of uh, our first crypto ETF here on B3. Uh, we were directly involved in, the, in that project. Uh, and given that, it was a huge success. You might have heard, right? We have, in, in less than a week, it's approaching already 1 billion uh, reals of, of assets under management inside the, the ETF, more than 30,000 investors. So it's a huge success. I think it proves the point that uh, the crypto uh, uh, instruments also belongs to the regulated environment. Let's, let's put it this way. And with that, I would, I would start um, asking Steve. Steve, I heard that yesterday the SEC once again delayed uh, its final decision on whether or not it will approve or disapprove the listing of uh, crypto instruments in, in the United States, right? I, I, I think there are, what, more than 10 uh, Bitcoin ETFs that are already filed, right, uh, with the SEC, and we still don't know whether these things will go ahead or not. What are your views on that? Uh, when we finally going to have a, a, a crypto instrument, a crypto, a Bitcoin ETF uh, traded on a major exchange in the United States? And overall, what are other possible milestones for the for the industry in the American market? I think that's a great question. If, if I had a uh, clear answer to that timing of when an ETF might be approved, I would probably be a, a very, very rich and highly sought after person. Um, of course, when we look at any new financial innovation, there's bound to be a, uh, a structure in place uh, from a regulatory lens that needs to be in place first before larger institutions and, and certainly before governments and regulators feel comfortable uh, giving their final blessing. And so I do think that uh, it has obviously been a long time that the SEC has been looking at this space. I know from uh, a lot of the publicly submitted uh, information as well as the response from the SEC that there is a, a group of really uh, intelligent and, and highly informed people um, within the regulatory bodies of, of sort of the US financial uh, framework looking at these issues. And I think the idea of taking a little bit longer to make sure that it's done and it's done correctly is probably a good thing for the space in the long term. Um, so I wish I could predict uh, when we would see an answer on that. Unfortunately, I do not, uh, other than my own speculation. Uh, you know, of it, it coming at some point in, in the future. And I think both ourselves and Fidelity uh, are presuming that someday there will be, uh, you know, SEC action approving such, uh, such a change. Um, to, your, to the second part of your question, I think that regulation really is a good thing for this market. Uh, for many of us that have sort of been uh, in this space for a number of years and have been of subscribing to the, this ethos of decentralization, uh, I do think that there's been an overemphasis on, on regulation being a negative for the industry when the reality is this regulation provides a very stable base by which larger players, institutions, publicly traded companies alike, feel much comfortable trading, in the, in trading and playing in the, in the space. And so while we don't know when it's happening, we can presume that there are uh, the right people in places in the US government uh, looking at these issues and really trying to promote innovation while ensuring that the appropriate protections are in place. And so I think over the next few months and in coming years, for sure, we will certainly see more progress on this particular subject. But but do you see like uh, all this eight, nine, ten 
ETFs that have filed uh, with the SEC coming to the market at the same time? Uh, does it make sense to have you know such a huge number of uh, Bitcoin ETFs trading at the same time? Uh, how, how do you see how, how is, is, is that going to happen? Well, so I think that's another great question. The reality is, it's certainly not the the case the the, the role of the SEC to be determining how many of something there are or aren't. That's of course more of a business case uh, that companies uh, like NASDAQ and like Fidelity and like many others would have to make about what the competitive landscape looks like. Uh, you know, there's obviously tens of thousands of, of indices. Many of them are, are, you know, not all that different. And at the end of the day, it's competing for trying to create tiny bits of sort of alpha and edge in producing, you know, higher quality products. And so I think that's what most institutions like NASDAQ are trying to accomplish at present. Um, now, as to your question about whether or not a single asset, uh, Bitcoin ETF or single asset Ethereum ETF, uh, would make sense if there was about you know, 10, 20, 30 of those, it probably would be the case that there would be some distribution of assets uh, to a few of the predominant players in that space with maybe some smaller ETFs that have some uh, advantages, whether it be on a cost basis or, or advantages on uh, some jurisdictional basis, for example, uh, might open up the door for there to be, you know, many of these. However, I think from what we've seen, it's probably safe to say that the first entrance into this market will likely capture a pretty sizable share of the the, the early market available to this uh, particular allocation, and that could have long-term advantages for sure. Yeah, that that that's what more or less what we. Uh, expect to happen with the hashtag ETF that we just launched, right? That being the first, they will probably uh, uh, have a competitive advantage over over other ETFs. Um, turning to Josh, Josh, um, Fidelity is uh, well known in Brazil as a, as being one of the three largest fund managers in the world. We also know that uh, that uh, Fidelity has a large brokerage platform as well. Uh, but people don't know very well what is Fidelity Digital Assets. And we talk about milestones in the previous questions. And, and certainly the creation of, of FDA was a milestone for the crypto <laughs> world, right? Could you explain us a little bit what, what is Fidelity Digital Assets? What do you do? What type of businesses you are uh, carrying in this, in this platform? Definitely. Um, and, and nice to meet everyone. And thank you so much for, for having us here. Um, it's an exciting day week for sure. Um, so Fidelity Digital Assets was launched in October 2018, but our, our inception actually predates October 2018. We um, at Fidelity have a group called the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. And that group has you know, number of different business units or, or research groups that look at things like blockchains or artificial intelligence. Um, and we understood pretty early on that there was a, this sort of pent up demand to provide services around digital assets. And so we started experimenting early on. We started mining Bitcoin in 2014. We started allowing employees to, to purchase things, uh, purchase lunch in the cafeteria with Bitcoin. And we started accepting Bitcoin as, as a form of charitable donation and through one of our charitable arms. And so it was sort of this own um, narrative, you know, that we had where we were mining Bitcoin, we were transacting in Bitcoin. We didn't have any way to custody it, to trade it. Um, and in, in 2015, the time frame where we were, do, where we were running these experiments, there really wasn't, you know, there wasn't really an evolved institutional landscape like we have today, right? Like the, if you went to someone in 2015 and you, you'd say, you know, NASDAQ, Fidelity, some of the largest banks in the world are, are involved in this space, most people probably wouldn't believe you. And so it's been a pretty um, rapid growth and, and, and development since then. But really what we did is we launched um, in 2018 a business unit out of our lab, out of our research effort into a commercial business line called Fidelity Digital Assets, really to meet the needs that we felt when we were um, exploring crypto and exploring early days of experimenting with Bitcoin. And so the services we provide today are around the custody and the trade execution for large institutions 
that want to access the marketplace, but they want to trust their custodian, you know, with holding their Bitcoin and they want to access regulated spot markets so that they can, you know, either buy more Bitcoin or, or sell Bitcoin um, against US dollar. And that's essentially the service that we have today. So uh, on the custody side, would you say that your client is uh, mostly institutional or also the retail clients can benefit and can have uh, uh, custody of their digital assets, of their crypto assets um, inside Fidelity? So to date, it's been institutional only, but there are some sort of there's, there's some sort of nuance around that. Um, so when we first launched, a lot of our demand was coming from family offices, ultra high net worth, sort of folks who could make a, a decision around investing in digital assets without relying on the decision making at a, at a board level or at an investment committee level. So a lot of early tech founders, a lot of early hedge funds, a lot of early passive investment vehicles, these became sort of our, our early clientele. And as, as we scaled on from, you know, I'd really say in the last year or so, 2020, I think, was, a, was an explosive year in the growth of digital assets where um, corporate treasurers started allocating part of their corporate balance sheets to Bitcoin. Insurance companies were allocating through their general accounts. Uh, university endowments, U.S. university endowments started allocating um, part of their endowment, um, their endowment funds to Bitcoin. So it's really been um, an upward trajectory in the types of clients we serve. To date, it's mostly institutional. Um, we launched actually today a, a program where uh, we will act as sub-custodian to other banks. So if a bank wants to use Fidelity Digital Assets and white label our technology, we, we support those sort of efforts as well. Um, but not yet for retail. And so, you know, that's been something that's, that's deep, you know, so, so, certainly deep within our minds and, and something we're focused on. Um, we just, we're, we don't have a product for retail at this time. It's, it's an institutional only platform. All right. But I understand that you are already uh, allowing uh, your institutional investors to use crypto as collateral for uh, loans, right? So essentially to leverage based on crypto, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. So there's been, you know, Bitcoin is a really interesting, if you're looking at the, the attributes of it from a collateral management perspective, it has a 24 seven mark to market. Um, it's, you know, there are capital gains associated with selling Bitcoin and it's very easily transferable. And so we had a lot of investors coming to us who are early holders of Bitcoin saying, hey, we want to use our Bitcoin for working capital or mining firms, for instance, coming to us and saying, hey, we, we're sitting on all this Bitcoin, but we need to pay our power supply and our power supplier doesn't accept Bitcoin. They accept US dollars or they accept, you know, another you know, form of fiat currency. And so there's a really interesting, compelling use case that we started seeing where our, our institutional clients want to want to gain exposure through using their or financing against their Bitcoin holdings. And so we also have a platform. It's really just an extension of the capabilities of our custody platform. So we're safeguarding the collateral, um, but we're work, working with both the, the um, both the, the the secured lender as well as the borrower. Um, to help facilitate the movement of those assets during the, the time of the loan of Bitcoin, for instance, um, appreciates significantly when someone needs to take margin off the plate or if they need to, if they need to provide contribution margin during the length of, 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 um, of a collateral arrangement, then we have the ability to accept it. So it's, it's allowing our clients to be more nimble in how they're using the, the assets that, uh, that they hold. All right. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. I, 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 I can't wait to see that happening in Brazil as well. Um, Steve, um, let's talk a little bit about Coinbase IPO, right? Since it was actually the first direct listing on, on NASDAQ. How important was Coinbase IPO uh, for the development of, of, of crypto in the United States uh, as a whole? And, and how do you see the, 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 the fact that Coinbase has such a high valuation now, uh, how, does, how do you see the, the, the room for more integration between, let's say, the crypto exchanges and the regulated exchanges, eventually even some sort of consolidation between uh, the two of those? 
definitely. So I think there's a few different categories and sort of uh, ways we want to look at that first question about Coinbase uh, and their direct listing on NASDAQ. Um, I think it makes a world of difference in terms of the credibility of the space uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to what's been lacking over the last few years in terms of institutional acceptance is truly a watershed moment where institutions that have been building up the infrastructure within this uh, growing asset class have sort of gained a seat at the, you know, the grown-ups table, so to speak. And I don't think there's any other example that a company could make that's more compelling than that, uh, than to, to go public in a successful offering on, um, on a, a major global exchange. And so on many dimensions, Coinbase going public, I think, is a very uh, compelling signal to the market that uh, first and foremost, this space is, uh, has grown up and is now at the level uh, of where other major globally publicly, global publicly traded companies are at. Uh, and when you look at, to your point, the valuation, uh, I think that its initial very high valuation to the market gives a, a really strong appetite and view of what the future earnings potential of a company like Coinbase is. Now, of course, there was some volatility initially in that launch, and uh, direct listings are tend to be known for that. But I think the, the really the core of the story is that uh, a large institution that's been building the infrastructure of, of this space for a number of years, making that leap to become a publicly traded company with transparent reporting, with quarterly uh, obligations to shareholders that are uh, out, outside their, you know, their private uh, investors. And I think most importantly, a higher threshold of standards that they now have to uh, comply within to ensure that they're meeting the standards and obligations of a publicly traded company. So I think it's an enormous signal to the market. Uh, as for your second question about what this means potentially as we move towards uh, you know, larger global integration of exchanges between what are considered to be more conventional or traditional asset classes and uh, new uh, digital assets, uh, I think is still a pretty wide bridge. And I think the main reason for that is the current existing financial system that we have today has, you know, quite literally taken decades, if not the greater part of the last hundred years to mature into what it is today. And many of the rules, regulations around, uh, around custody of those traditional assets around standards for trading, standards for settlement, uh, rules on reporting requirements uh, are very well established and highly tailored towards those type of instruments. With digital assets, you know, as, as Josh was alluding to, there's a higher degree of programmability. There's a, a significantly different um, composability of how assets can be allocated, how they can be um, moved, what they can represent. And so from a regulatory standpoint, there's a much larger hurdle or burden from a, from a decision-making and sort of rule-making perspective as to how to create standards that this new digital asset class is going to play in at a more regulated and, and more controlled level. And the important part about that is because there's a more complex rule-making uh, path that needs to, be, uh, needs to be completed, I don't believe that we're probably close to having truly integrated exchanges that can facilitate the exchange of all of these assets until some of these really hard problems get solved and the comfort level uh, among regulators becomes a little bit more confident and, and, and high, higher than it is today. Uh, and I think looking at this from the perspective, it's one hurdle at a time. And you know, in the conversation around ETFs, I think that's probably the, the first sort of target in the short term that would most likely need to be uh, need to be approved before we can start getting towards a more globally integrated financial network. Though I do think that someday we have the potential to, to end up there. Okay, and in, in terms of, let's say, potential crypto IPOs, Coinbase was really the 
one that everybody was expecting, right? Or you see any anything else related to crypto that could come with an IPO near term? Well, I think maybe this is a good question for both Josh and I to answer uh, with giving a broader view of the space. There are certainly many companies out there that are uh, that are earning a lot of money and earning the type of money that would certainly be commensurate with a publicly traded sized entity. Um, at present, the majority of these entities are exchanges. And so when you, when you look at that particular slice of the marketplace, there probably is a larger hesitancy to, for, for those types of entities to make themselves public because it really does exponentially increase the scrutiny and the challenges that they would have to abide by being more publicly uh, open. And so from the exchange side, uh, it's hard to predict if any of these companies will make a move to become public. Uh, I'm talking, speaking of course, of the larger publicly or the larger uh, retail exchanges, though I think certainly very, several of them probably are positioned to potentially move down that path. From the point of view, and this is where I'd love to hear Josh's view as well on this, of the, you know, the, the blockchain infrastructure type of companies, uh, there's some interesting players out there that probably have the potential and sort of the current revenue to, to go public. Um, I should probably avoid naming specific <laughs> companies because you know, that could potentially indicate that I know something, which, which in this case, I, you know, I'm separated from that line of the business. Um, but what I would suspect is that certain companies that are doing uh, on-chain analytics and analysis, uh, in particular, if they're doing so with government agencies, probably are positioned to potentially make that consideration. And then some of the large wallet providers that do some exchange trading, but also have started to dabble with, uh, with doing some collateralized lending and borrowing, would also, I think, be candidates to consider this in the future. Um, as to when that happens, uh, you know, that's something that the market just has to wait to find out. Steve, I'd add on the one infrastructure, you know, sort of segment that I think could really benefit from the public markets is the is the mining space where, um, you know, I think every other element of the digital asset ecosystem can benefit from venture funding, you know, raising a series A or a series B, you know, 20 million U.S. dollars to 50 million U.S. dollars normally in size, I think is enough capital for a lot of these firms to get up and running, given a lot of the technology is open sourced, you know, a lot of the a lot of it's finding market fit um, and integrating your product. And so for startups in the crypto space, you can be relatively nimble and, and launch without a huge uh, overhead in terms of in terms of capital. Mining is completely different. You need uh, you need upfront capital to purchase the equipment. You need access to cheap electricity. You need access to to a hosting venue, and you know a lot of these a lot of these companies are actually seeing access the public markets through the SPAC market. Um, and I think we'll start to see you know I think blockchain infrastructure companies, mining companies, companies that are producing the parts of the supply chain that are that are in, being integrated into um, uh, uh, the mining equipment, the ASIC. Uh, hardware and the GPU hardware, I think we may see some some activity in that space as well. I would not be surprised, just given how helpful capital is to uh, to the mining side of the business. Okay. Any names specifically that you would mention, uh, Josh, in terms of, of companies that are, would be closer to the public market? No names to mention, um, but certainly, you know, I think for 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 most of these mining companies, there's going to be opportunities to grow in the public markets, given how successful we've seen um, some IPOs and SPACs this year. So I, I no names, but I certainly would, wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if we see more do that this year. Uh, Josh, uh, w one question that I personally have: I know I know you are not close to the let's say to the brokerage side. Of fidelity, but how, in general, are advisors, financial advisors in the U.S. dealing with crypto, or if, if you cannot say generally, but at least the ones that are uh, uh, working with fidelity, are they actively recommending uh, um, uh, crypto uh, to the clients' portfolios, or the clients still do that more or less on their own, and uh, it's not part of the, let's say, attribution of the average advisor in the U.S. to talk about? crypto because you know there is not 
many places for you to custody, etc. It's probably a bit more difficult for, for, for the advisor to talk about that. How, how is that uh, working in the United States? Yeah, so we work with the various we work with various advisors or advisory groups, and some have taken a really um, you know forward thinking stance and said we're going to allocate X percent of client portfolios to Bitcoin, and so we'll work with clients who onboard you know 50 100 client accounts, and of those 50 or 100 client accounts, they're all allocated based on their percentage of percentage of assets they own to to a, a number of Bitcoin, and so. Certainly, you know, there are some advisors out there who I would dub as, as, as really, you know, on the cutting edge of this that have thought of ways to gain exposure, not only just to Bitcoin, but for other digital assets as well for their, for their customers. So that, that definitely exists. I'd say the vast majority of advisors are reacting to client demand. And you're looking at a turn, the, the generational turnover of wealth in the United States is starting. And the d products that the younger generations are demanding are digital and they want crypto as part of their portfolio. You can see it and, 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 and the trends are very obvious in terms of who's making announcements these days in terms of supporting digital assets. You had, um, you have PayPal, you have Square, you have Robinhood, you have Wealthfront. These are all companies that are majority millennial used. And so um, I think a lot of those companies are reacting to client demand. I'd say on the advisory side, most advisors are, um, are, are going to be reactive and they may have some clients who in order to, to maintain and grow that relationship with that client, they may onboard with, with someone like us um, to, to specifically handle a few edge cases. Um, holistically, I'd say, you know, we're still getting there as an industry around uh, supporting the asset class and, and having advisors be comfortable talking about it. Because if you've gone to, you know, if you've taken the CFA and I know there's, there's a great program, um, it's a great, you know, program with part of the CFA now that talks about digital assets. But if you're, if you've gone down the path of being able to recommend assets to clients and, and built your whole career around this, Bitcoin and digital assets were not a part of that curriculum. So there's a big learning curve that people have to go through, um, you know, it, and, and we're seeing that start to happen. We're seeing the education begin at, you know, not just we want to learn about digital assets, but we want to learn and we want to get a few clients into this space, a few of our Cavalier clients who really have been demanding this of us, and then we're going to follow on with additional clients after that. So I'd say that's the path that most folks are going down. Um, it's finding the right model for a few clients and then building that out over time as, as, um, as more people start to demand it. And as their models change and they look at Bitcoin or, or, other, um, or other digital assets as a way to you know, enhance return or minimize uh, volatility or how, whatever their, their end goal for their clients would be. Yeah, that, that's interesting because our recent experience with the, with the hashtag CTF here in Brazil was very... Uh, uh, interesting in this sense that that uh, it was probably the first time that some financial advisors, right, uh, linked to Genial, linked to other uh, distributors, were talking about uh, crypto actually, right? And it was interesting to see that the message seemed to have gotten through, right? We, out of this 30,000 uh, investors on on a hashtag CTF, many are new to the crypto universe. And the interesting thing, they came with like small size tickets, right? Really like testing the war, trying to understand a bit better what they are buying so that they can, you know, uh, later on decide what is the right size for crypto in their, in their portfolios, right? So it's, that, that, that's why I was curious to see how, you know, advisors in the US were dealing with that. Um, let's talk a little bit about tokenization. Uh, Steve, uh, is it a risk for the regulated exchanges that some shares start trading outside of the exchanges and under the form of tokens? How, how do you see that? How, how close we are to that happening in, in, in the international markets? How, how much uh, regulatory uh, uh, obstacles this, this tokenization will, will face? Um, actually, I mean, you can, you can reply from the, the point of view of NASDAQ, but I would like to hear a little bit Josh's views on that as well? It's, it's a really great question. Um, and, and for anyone in the audience uh, 
who, who's maybe not familiar with this, some exchanges around the world, I'll use FTX as an example, uh, have actually begun uh, trading effectively synthetic token-based uh, uh, equities, but in the form of, of, of actual you know, on-chain tokens. So other actors outside of uh, you know, the traditional larger exchanges have already come up with their own ways of doing this uh, and using price oracles and a variety of other techniques to be able to track price and then, of course, create their own settlement mechanisms. Uh, and there's some complexities about how they've made that all work. But the reality is that when it comes to tokenizing equities in that sort of off-market capacity, uh, there hasn't been anything legally, regulatory, or otherwise, at least in the jurisdictions where that's been done, from preventing that sort of activity. Now, from the standpoint of, of NASDAQ and decisions we might make strategically around tokenizing equities or more traditional assets in the future, it actually becomes more of a business conversation than it would, than it would uh, seem. And what I mean by that is the economics of, cur of products currently traded on NASDAQ are incredibly efficient on a scale that is really hard to comprehend. Um, our matching engine is, is truly a marvel in its ability to, uh, to actively fill orders, and from the standpoint of the speed and the cost and the efficiency at which that whole system works, uh, the current infrastructure for trading existing products is actually quite developed from purely just the technology standpoint to where uh, unless you're talking about building different products on top of it and doing some more unique things, there's a lot of practical arguments to be made that uh, it would be more cumbersome to try to replace that infrastructure for something that's working exceptionally well. And then you layer on top of that all of the regulatory compliance questions and the standards uh, that exist around settlement. Um, and a lot of that is done through sort of the third party, the, the large global uh, third party settlement uh, you know, houses. And that infrastructure has taken decades to build up and works exceptionally well. Now, from the standpoint of thinking about and really, I just bring that up because I think you have to look at any new technology from an economic decision standpoint of what's worthwhile to try to do with it, as opposed to trying to do something better that's already being done well. Find those use cases potentially where tokenizing assets or products um, that either haven't been done yet or can be done in a substantially better way is really the best fit for this sort of technology. And especially because as that occurs, some of the regulatory frameworks that we're all waiting for will start to be put in place and evolve alongside those newly traded products or derivatives of existing products. Uh, and so really the stance there is that if you're looking for some unique use cases around uh, to what assets would make sense to tokenize in, from conventional markets, you would want to look at really inefficient uh, asset classes. And there are some out there where the margins are particularly high because there is an asymmetry of information or just poor order matching. Um, and so when you look at swaps, derivatives, and that sort of thing, uh, there probably is a marketplace for tokenizing some conventional assets in that fashion. But in terms of the existing infrastructure, as much as I would love as a, you know, a big believer in this technology for NASDAQ and all of these global exchanges to tokenize existing equities, there's a lot of economic reasons why it's probably not that uh, pragmatic to do so. Uh, in the, for the time being. That said, I still agree that there's immense opportunity to go after some of these new sort of asset classes. And you look at new types of bonds around um, ESG and some other areas there, uh, there definitely is an immense opportunity to capture some of those, uh, some of those new markets with this technology. Josh, you wanna comment on that? Yeah, I can just say, you know, we are, uh, I'll give the Fidelity view and then I can give you my views as well. So Fidelity is a Bitcoin only custodian. We do believe in a future where, you know, all assets will have some form of tokenized version and they'll live on a blockchain and be exchanged in, in that way. But I think Steve made some really good points around why it's just not practical to, to um, predict around when that could happen. I think what's more practical is we're seeing this already play out, right? I think what we've seen from, 
in the last two years, the growth of stable coins as really like one of the best use cases we've had to date of a tokenized asset where it's just dollar backed or it's fiat reserved. Most, most stable coins are either going to be one-to-one -one fiat reserved or they're going to have some sort of algorithmic mechanism that pegs them to another asset's price. And we're seeing nearly, you know, we're seeing trillions of dollars essentially be printed on top of these on top of these infrastructures so that you can have something that settles alongside a digital asset. So the example I give is if someone wants to trade Bitcoin, and there's still a cash side of that transaction. So whoever's trading Bitcoin is still taking on the commodity risk of the price until settlement actually happens, until the orders are matched and settled. If you have a stable coin, then you can really just use tokenized dollars to transact versus that Bitcoin. You don't have that outstanding counterparty risk. You don't have that outstanding settlement risk. Um, it just makes transacting in digital assets that much smoother because the network rails that we have for cash are not as fast as, as the rails that were built for, for digital assets. And the, just quickly on other areas of tokenization that not necessarily um, we get a lot of demand in from a client perspective, but certainly are interested in, at least in terms of how you know, we view the world. Um, the first one is decentralized finance. So DeFi has been a really novel development in the last year and a half where you know, we're looking at you know, sort of disruption of the middleman in a financial transaction and relying on the code to facilitate um, yield um, generating activities to match peer-to-peer -peer loans. It's just been very fascinating to watch that space develop. I, I think there's there's some insularities and some sort of, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's the user experience is not ideal yet, but that's really interesting, just the amount of, of the amount of assets that are locked in, in DeFi protocols and we continue to see that grow. And then on non-fungible tokens, um, you know, I think using a tokenized real world asset as a way to extract new value for creators is really important, whether that be digital art, music. Um, we're basically coming up with ways to democratize funding for, for artists and for uh, athletes and for other folks who you know, create something of, of, of you know, of value of, of whether that be music or, or, or digital art and um, and provide authenticity and allow a, a way for those those types of assets to be traded. So I think there's a lot of interesting things happening there. Um, certainly, you know, seeing the price of digital art increase in traditional auction houses now allowing, um, you know, auctioning and auctioning off some of these pieces, it's just been very fascinating to see that market develop, though I don't think there's a strong institutional demand just yet for, for participating. Okay, yeah, this is certainly fascinating. I would have a lot of follow-up questions on that, but we don't have time and we uh, need to open for at least one question of the audience. So I don't know uh, if we have anyone on the line to, to ask a question. Oh, here we are. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Um, so I had one question uh, during this discussion. Could you just you say your name, about... please? Um, hi, I'm Isabella. <laughs> uh, during this discussion, you have spoken about the main challenges in adapting stock market infrastructure for blockchain adoption. Um, which one factor do you believe will be the most challenging as this market evolves? Technology, security or regulation? Who want to take first? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to go out that first. So, uh, Isabel, it's a great question. I do think that each of those areas you identified do lay out some degree of challenge. Um, in my view, I think some of the technological challenges and, and sort of the the custody challenges are are quite solvable and within our grasp and in. in in many ways, I think the solutions already exist. They just haven't been applied. Uh, that said, you can't underestimate how hard it is to update legacy infrastructure uh, in systems that have been dependent on for decades to uh, to be able to, you know, effectively, uh, you know, be the rails upon which our financial system works. So those problems are not without heavy lifting. But I actually fundamentally of the three believe that the regulatory challenges might present the biggest obstacle 
purely because the pace at which this particular asset class is changing is a nightmare for uh, for anyone in a position writing laws or enforcing laws and rules due to the fact that the market is 24 seven, seven days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And within that time period, you have an open source global community of developers, uh, programmers, entrepreneurs who are constantly trying to create new uh, incarnations of what can be done in this financial system, or as Josh alluded to, this sort of created a uh, global system of, of IP ownership or property ownership in the form of non-fungible tokens. And so I think that largely speaking, uh, traditional finance is going to start to move over and solve some of those technical challenges. Uh, you already see entities looking at how they could solve, how they could settle in stable coins, for example. And so I think that force is gonna be pushing, but it's a bit like, to use an analogy like driverless cars, that, the technology exists. All of us could be effectively being driven around uh, by these vehicles today, more or less, uh, minus some tweaks that need to happen for it to be truly at the level where it's, you know, it's 100%. But ultimately, that's probably not going to occur until the world becomes comfortable with that. And the world becomes comfortable when governments, jurisdictions, and society ultimately become comfortable through very clear rules and regulations. And again, the nature of how quickly this changes presents challenges of how accurately those rules can be uh, can be developed and then maintained over time. So I genuinely think a big part of that bridge will depend on some of the regulatory uh, developments that we see in the coming years. Uh, but it's, I think it's a great question. I can, I can take the bait and also answer on behalf of regulatory. I'll do so, I live in, uh, I should caveat, I live in Washington, DC. So a lot of this stuff is happening all around me. Um, but really, you know, there's just a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and a lot of those unanswered questions have to do with, you know, what is like we don't in the United States, for instance, have a we have a patchwork framework of, of regulatory of, of state by state regulations around money transmission. Money transmission as a digital asset custodian or as a digital asset exchange is much different than you know, let's say a, a, a fiat exchange or, or capturing data on you know someone who's operating a cash exchange. So there's just a lot of unanswered questions. I think um, that that hopefully we'll get clarity on in the next couple of years. Um, I think additionally, you know, I mentioned before decentralized finance. This is just it's a counterpartyless system, right? There's no central counterparty. So how do you wrap your head around? Is it actually an exchange? There's just so many questions that you know regulators are going to have to grapple with, and I think they probably have the hardest position to be in right now because they want to force, uh, they don't want to force behavior. They want to watch the the, the market mature and and, and and put in regulation that actually help guide things in the right way. Um, and so now you know you guys have the the ETF in Brazil. There's ETFs in Canada. Um, but all the all eyes now turn on the United States to see what's going to happen there. And we have a relatively favorable, we believe, um, SEC commissioner with staff who understand this. Um, again, Gary Gensler was previously teaching a course at MIT about Bitcoin and digital assets. And and so, you know, there's there's going to be some dialogue. Um, and I think right now the, the people who are in charge are capable of having that dialogue. And I think that's going to certainly change the course. I just think the pace of innovation, Steve, to your point, is going to going to outpace um, the way at which regulators can keep up. And at some point, there's just going to need to be much closer dialogue between the two. But having said that, you know, we think there's the like look at the the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, for instance, in the US, they have a sandbox. You can go to their sandbox with an idea, you can test your idea out with them. And, and if they see any issues with it, you will learn through that process. And that's not, you know, that's that I think taking a very favorable approach towards allowing people to innovate without creating, um, really creating or, 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 or just not allowing that, that process, to, that creative destruction sort of process to happen. So. Um, regulation is going to be certainly um, the laggard, but something that um, we all, you know, hope will will catch up in the next couple of years. That's great, um, Josh, Steve. 
I want to thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. I had a, a bunch of questions left here, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, we, 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 we got to our time and we have to let you go as well. But again, thank you very much. I think for many uh, uh, in, in our audience, it was the first time they had a chance of hearing someone uh, from, you know, large institutions in the U.S. talk about crypto, and I'm sure that they learned a little bit about what to expect uh, for this uh, asset class going forward, what, what, they, what are the developments that can uh, happen in the U.S. going forward. And we know that wh whatever happens in the U.S. will end up, you know, uh, 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 impacting the rest of the, the crypto uh, world, right? So thank you very much for your time. It was a great pleasure. And now pass back to Denise, que vai terminar uh, o seminário de hoje e concluir com as palavras finais. Thank you very much, guys. Likewise, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.